Chimere is a distant planet. It is defined by waves of life brought from Earth and set free to evolve independently in this new context. The indigenous life of the planet, swarms of microbes called magic by the people who live there, are what harvest Earth organisms and make copies on Chimere. As the asteroid which concluded the Mesozoic never struck Chimere, dinosaurs remain the dominant terrestrial megafauna. Proboscideans are an order of Afrothere mammals consisting of only one surviving family, the elephants. They are famous for their trunks, tusks, and great size. There were once many other families, including the Stegodonts, Mastodonts, and Gumphotheres. In antiquity, they were assumed to be related to rhinos and hippos, making up a clade called the Pachyderms, a much cooler name in my opinion, but we now know that hippos, rhinos, and elephants evolved their similarities independently, so the name is no longer scientifically valid. Although proboscideans have ancient origins as smaller beasts, and indeed the tiny hyrax is one of their closest living relatives alongside manatees, since the Miocene, proboscideans are usually the largest animals in their environment. They may have included the largest terrestrial mammals with a fragmentary Paleoloxodon fossil in India, controversially estimated to be 16 feet tall and weighing a staggering 24 tons, though most of this species are estimated to be at least 10 tons lighter, so a real represents an extreme rather than an average. Most proboscideans had tusks, with some growing to an extreme of 5 meters or 16 feet in the largest elephants and mastodonts. The dynastic extinction of Chimere 15 million years ago devastated the territory of the portal, and most terrestrial flora and fauna were wiped out. This clean slate had some reconquest by native plants and animals, but most of the niches were populated by a harvest that collected animals from North America as soon as the region recovered. The first proboscidean introduced to Chimere was a gomphothere. They and other four-tusked proboscideans were called oliphants by naturalists of the assembly, using the archaic English term for elephants and their ivory to differentiate between them and true elephants until gomphotheres were coined in the early 1900s, though many assembly naturalists still use the term for any proboscidean with tusks on the lower jaw. Gomphotheres were adaptable nomads and the perfect candidate for harvest. Back on Earth, they rapidly spread across Asia from their African homeland up to America, and they thrived wherever they went thanks to no significant competition and no predators large enough to take them down. When they arrived in Chimere, a land of unprecedented abundance thanks to rich volcanic soil and minimal competition and no major threats, Gomphotheres erupted in population and range, becoming one of the most successful large herbivores of this time. Calicaliers quickly grew to outcompete them in size, and the bear dog Amphicyon was not far behind in getting large enough to bring them down. The period after the dynastic extinction, lasting around half a million years, really was a mammal's world. Increasing humidity and a hotter climate saw the spread of dense rainforests across the known world. This caused a number of extinctions and subsequent harvest from South America's dense jungles to match, but the Gomphotheres continued to thrive and diversify. It seems that, like their spread across Earth, Gomphotheres spread with ease beyond the known world at this time, island hopping both to Kairul in the east and fast approaching continent of Arvel to the west. Twelve million years ago, disaster came from both sides. From the east came the Titanosaurs. They plowed through the jungles, establishing an open forest status quo filled with the gymnosperms that they preferred. Not only did they compete for space and reduce the preferred food of gomphotheres and other browsing animals, this open habitat was perfect for a threat from the west that gomphotheres had never faced before. Large Theropods Megaraptorans during this era, called the Warring Clades period, were not as robust as the family which now dominate modern Chimere, but they were still predators notably larger than the Gomphotheres. Without dense forests to protect their flanks and calves, and facing a sudden decline in their preferred food, Gomphotheres in the known world seem to have quickly been pushed to the fringe wetland forests where titans didn't like to go. 
Those who remained in open territory appear to have quickly been hunted to extinction. In response to this combination of invaders from east and west, a harvest collected fauna from Central Asia. Proboscideans got a much-needed reinforcement. The species of gomphothere harvested at this time was better adapted to open terrain, with longer legs and tusks. They quickly monopolized open grasslands which, while not as common at the time as fern prairies, didn't have any large mammal occupants. Unfortunately, this resulted in a population boom, and the abundance drew the attention of theropods, which the gomphotheres initially fared poorly against. It seems predator pressures forced them to invest in increasing intelligence and sociality. A highly sophisticated network of childcare and bulls living with their mother's herd to only briefly depart and mate is believed to have helped bring their young to adulthood with better success. Their large front tusks seem to have been mostly utilized in display, while the lower tusks would have been driven into restrained opponents, and this proved to be fairly efficient in confrontations. After a tenuous million years or so, it appears their population and relationship with Megaraptor has stabilized. The intelligence and sophisticated social defenses of grassland oliphants meant that they could endure this new predator, and their population were maintained especially by claiming any unattended offspring, though adults could still be killed as well, so members of the herd truly relied upon one another. Platy Belladon was also introduced to Chimir during this harvest. These bizarre, shovel-tusked browsers took over the jungles. This brought unwanted competition from the forest gomphotheres of the initial Proboscidean introduction. Platy Belladon took over the Crescent, and the forest gomphotheres' range was pushed further north. Being quite vulnerable to theropod predation, Platy Belladon stuck to closed forests. Stegolophodon was another forest specialist harvested at the same time, this one from the Stegodont clade. Like Platybelodon, they were fairly small and well suited to Chimere's closed forests, helping them both avoid theropods and the massive titanosaurs. Their fossils have been found throughout Nekar and are the most common forest proboscidean at the time, suggesting rapid and widespread success after the initial Platybelodon explosion. The Stegodonts also spread to Arvel, where they thrived and spread to cooler regions. Mastodonts were forest specialized browsers also brought during this period. The genus, either Mammut or Zigolophodon, depending on who you ask, is contested, but either way, they only had minimal success during this time. These were enormous animals, with bulls sporting tusks nearly as long as they were, and at 16 tons, possibly the heaviest proboscidean from Earth, considering the dubious nature of Paleoloxodon nematicus, the closed forests did not suit them. For a while, they seemed to have made a life for themselves in the highland forests of Nikar, and in this specialized niche, they became the largest terrestrial mammals of their day, with the largest bulls reaching a staggering 25 tons. A fifth proboscidean harvested from Asia at the same time was Dinotherium. They were more cursorial, with leaner builds and longer strides, so were taller and better able to not only get between favorable stands of tree that didn't put them in competition with titans, were quite efficient travelers, and also needed a lot less food. This build proved quite successful. When faced with theropods, Dinotherium's downward-facing tusks proved a superior weapon than the conventional proboscidean and upper tusks. Those of gomphotheres could push aside an approaching theropod and possibly gore at the right angle, while Dinotherium could take them down with considerable force and not only puncture, but easily extract. Their lean build also allowed for greater investment in armor that, thanks to a more compact build, gomphotheres could not afford without risk of overheating. Over time, the Chimera and Dinotherium invested less in intelligence so that they could get by on less nutritious diet and invest in more defenses and faster pregnancy and growth. These adaptations resulted in their widespread success, even as competition came from all sides. Dinotherium spread to Kairul, where they have since diversified into several species. 
The first proboscidean harvested, arguably belonging to the same family of elephants, was from Africa around 10 million years ago, the four-tusked elephant Stegotetrabelodon. As a generalist browser and grazer, this animal could share territory with grassland gomphotheres and establish dinotherium, and so could retain their large size. But they had no defenses in behavior or anatomy against the now-established Megaraptorans. Facing their four spear-like tusks at a foe would have been quite intimidating, though it was unlikely to be much of a deterrent, as Megaraptorans could restrain the tusk and then bring their claws to bear. However, their greatest vulnerability was, of course, their young. Lacking the intensity of child care seen on prairie gomphotheres or reproductive speed and efficiency of dinotheres, it appears they did not last long. The African species of dinotherium was introduced at this time, and while it seems they may have had some hybridization with chimerian species, either by being too few in number or some other factor, they seem to have quickly gone extinct. The resident species was already better suited to fend off Megaraptorans and digest resident food, so this new species failed to outcompete them. This trend of resident taxa already having better anatomical and behavior deterrence of Megaraptorans seems to have excluded any other African taxa harvested at this time. There was faunal interchange with Arvel millions of years prior thanks to island chains and the shallowness of the inland sea to the south, with stegodonts being the proboscidean pioneers. However, 8 million years ago, a land bridge between the western continent and Nikar to the northwest of the known world resulted in a spike of this faunal interchange. Along with animals that came north with the ancestors of robust monarchs, the family of Megaraptorans, which now dominate Chimere today. These robust monarchs were expert grapplers able to adeptly restrain in their powerful jaws and use strong limbs and surprisingly flexible arms to position long talons for a piercing strike at windpipes or between ribs. Although not as large as modern species, they were still big enough to pose a threat, and it seems Dinotherium was driven to extinction in the known world due to this predatory pressure, though floral turnover may have contributed as well. Grassland olifants, on the other hand, appear to have endured predation. Perhaps because they initially invested heavily in intelligence and social complexity, they appear to have endured the threat of extinction and instead underwent an evolutionary arms waste with the Megaraptorans. Having four sets of tusks, two for restraint and two for goring, has been posited as a superior counter to theropods than the conventional pair more derived proboscideans possess. Unfortunately, their arms race with the robust monarchs appears to have overall been detrimental to other proboscideans harvested. A third wave of gomphotheres were introduced from North America 8 million years ago, following an extinction of dinotheres and other organisms lost in the interchange. Unlike the grassland olifant, which evolved alongside the monarchs, the new American gomphotheres had no defenses against such massive and derived predators, and appear to have been hunted to extinction within a few hundred thousand years of introduction. This sacrifice, shifting Megaraptor and focus to easier prey, may have given grassland olifants some breathing room. Mastodon of the genus Mammut were harvested during this time as well. It appears they did well for themselves in the highland forests of Arvel, thriving in the higher elevation and cooler regions. This habitat did not support giant theropods as it was dense and uneven terrain. Although the enormous mastodonts of Nikar seem to have gone extinct by this time, the clade picked up in Arvel and flourished. They encountered stegodonts there and seems to have largely outcompeted them. Amabelodonts came from North America and, although they didn't outcompete their resident cousins in Nikar, they followed mastodons to Arvel and appear to have done well alongside their larger cousins, sticking to denser forests. An increasingly humid climate spread throughout the jungles and wetlands, which restricted the range of titanosaurs. Floodplains in greater territory than before proved a great boon to grassland olifants, and they experienced a boom in population and diversity. Unfortunately, this increased humidity and heat resulted in increased storms, and a great phosphorus runoff wiped out most fish in the entire southwestern range of Nikar due to triggering an unprecedented bloom of magic and algae. 
This put some strain on proboscideans due to poisoning the waterways, but the real trouble came when the environment stabilized. A new harvest came, this one from South America six million years ago, and the sloths introduced at this time thrived in the humid conditions that so many niches had been opened up for by the extinction events which preluded their harvest, and the indigenous fauna generally lost ground. Sloths, another South American megafauna, came prepared to deal with theropod predators in the form of terror birds, an advantage few mammals having been introduced to Chimere possess. Although the grassland oliphant managed to survive this overwhelming combination of climate change, floral and faunal turnover, and increased competition, Platybelodon went extinct. Stegodon coexist with forest mastodons, although they were quite rare. Grassland oliphants were the last proboscideans in the known world of Nikar, while mastodons were the last of their kind in Arvel, at least with any sort of abundance. Over the next five million years, the known world stabilized in an era called the Anchored or Harbored Age by Chimeran paleontologists in reference to its general lack of harvests and ecological stability. Some consider it a dynasty of its own, though usually it is considered to be too short a time period for such a designation. Outside of the Titan Gardens, sloths, oliphants, and theskelosaurs were the dominant megafaunal herbivores at this time. Around 40 million years ago, a relic population of gonfathiers, descended from the very first Chimeran proboscideans, returned to the known world from dense jungles to the north, and spread throughout whatever dense wet forest soil the Titans hadn't claimed, and eventually ended up outcompeting the Toxodonts, which had initially claimed these jungles following the extinction of Platybelodon. The highlands of Arvel became increasingly warm, and the Titans reclaimed many regions pushing mastodons to the fringes and outcompeting the last stegodonts. Around 1.5 million years ago, the known world changed, shifting to a cooler and drier climate. Titan Gardens were reduced in Arvel due to the region south of the mountains once again becoming too cold for their liking, yet extended in Nikar, and the dry climate reduced humid jungles. This shift in jungles to open forest resulted in another harvest, this one from Southeast Asia, and was one of the largest harvesting events in recent history, perhaps due to the known world experiencing two extinctions at the same time, one in the cooler Arvalith Highlands, and one throughout much of Nikar. Mastodons were endangered and, although the titans left, the forests gave way to grasslands that they were ill-suited for. The very last of the mainland stegodonts went extinct at this time. Grassland oliphants were minimally impacted by these changes, although their forest cousins lost much ground. Elephas, the genus of modern Asian elephants, was harvested and introduced to the forests of both Nikar and Arvel. It does not appear that they did terribly well, perhaps due to difficulty finding food in the changing jungles, competition with the last gonfathiers in this shrinking niche, or predation from now massive and derived monarchs, although held out in dense forests of Arvel for at least a few hundred thousand years, though an animal from the same harvest proved to be their downfall. Stegodonts got a second chance in this harvest in the form of their namesake, Stegodon itself. They were browsing specialists. Although on Earth a more generalist diet of Asian elephants resulted in them outcompeting Stegodon, in Chimere it was this specialization that was the advantage. They still suffered at the hands of Megaraptorans and appear to have only held on in Arvel. Unfortunately, the forest gomphotheres were pushing south by the expanding territory of the Titan Gardens. Being used to Megaraptorans and having long established behaviors that newcomers lacked, along with comfort with local fauna, forest gomphotheres outcompeted the stegodonts wherever they went. The steppe mammoth was harvested from the northern range of the Asian harvest. They were set free in the vast highland steppes of southern Arvel. This habitat had been hit hard by a change in currents and the cooling climate, going from Titan gardens to a mosaic of pine forest and grassy steppe, so the mammoths faced no competition. The uneven terrain appears to have been a limiting factor in their size, for they shaved off a few tons from their average size, but their population was enormous. 
Mastodon persisted in the scattered forests, but they were rare. Kajar was a temperate peninsula and the most forested, and it was here that Mastodon held out in their last great numbers. For the better part of a million years, the mammoths of Arvel enjoyed an easy life without predators. Stegodons holding out in Arvel's warm northern forest, however, went extinct during this time, seemingly due to forest oliphant competition. The two oliphant lineages, forest and grassland, both recovered their populations. An unprecedented predator had been introduced from Southeast Asia. For most of this year, they were quite low in population and generally restricted to the mosaic forests and grasslands of central Nikar. Their population steadily increased, however, and their high intelligence, efficiency in travel, and increasingly sophisticated technology proved to be Chimera's first taste of a resident that would dramatically reshape the known world and beyond. This was Homo erectus. Although fairly reclusive in Nikar as these archaic humans began to spread out, they were forced to adapt to this increasingly led to their dominance. Everything changed when they arrived in the cool highlands of Arvel around 800,000 years ago. It was here that they encountered vast herds of mammoth and mastodon, some thousands of animals strong. A few small predators were present, and the occasional Megaraptoran crossed the mountains in the more tolerable summer months to enjoy a feast, but generally Homo erectus faced no competition. They slaughtered their way across the highlands, nearly driving the mammoths to extinction and wiping out all mastodon. As one should now anticipate, this sudden loss in biomass triggered another harvest. The fauna harvested from this time include numerous predators, such as massive cats and giant hyenas who all competed with the first Chimeran humans. It also flooded the highlands with much greater biodiversity than before. Two proboscideans were harvested, including more steppe mammoths and Paleoloxodon. Being the same species, just a lot larger, the steppe mammoth integrated with their established cousins and shrank for similar reasons, eventually dominating the grasslands once more. Paleoloxodon persisted in the forests, but also spread south to Kajar, where they became the dominant megafauna there, being a generalist that could switch between the specialist mammoth and mastodon present. Unlike mammoths, they did not shrink, although outside of Kajar their population was never large. Some peoples of Arvel remained in the highlands and Kajar, despite the increasing competition by this harvest, but most spread to islands and from there there was an eruption in their range. Although this triggered many more extinctions as they spread beyond the known world, that's a topic for another time. The last collections of this harvest marked another half million years of stability. Mammoth, Mastodon, and Paleoloxodon thrived in Kajar. Mammoths and Paleoloxodon shared the Arvella Highlands and oliphants carried on to the north. Disaster came for the grassland oliphants from the northeast. Housy grass had arrived. This highly aggressive and competitive species of grass is almost impossible to digest without specialization. As it spread throughout the grasslands of the north, choking out the soil and other species relying upon it, thousands of plant and animal species went extinct in the geological blink of an eye. Many beasts from Cairo marched through Nikar with the spread of grass only they could efficiently process, adding pressure to whatever existing animals could endure. Grassland oliphants were quickly replaced by glenos in much of their former range. The megaraptorans that oliphants were used to were also replaced by a highly derived predator specialized for the housey prairie, the Uktan. Uktan are far more intelligent, socially sophisticated, and their highly lightweight build makes them surprisingly limble and swift considering they are as long and broad as a T-Rex. Oliphants found themselves outmaneuvered by these predators, and their young much more often prey than when they were faced with basal megaraptorans they evolved alongside before. To make matters worse, a massive influx of fauna from the grasslands of Pleistocene Africa added to the competition. 
Bovids, such as the Great Buffalo, were one of the few invasive species that could make the most of housey grass due to already being specialized in processing tough C4 plants. Two species of African elephant were introduced to Chimere at this time, bush and forest elephants. Forest elephants fared to compete with woodland oliphants, and while bush elephants seemed to have had short-term success, the combined pressure of the newly arrived Uktan in competition with the Glanos proved too much for them, and they seemed to have died out rather quickly. Their presence appears to have adversely affected the last grassland oliphants too, and the pair competing for limited space and resources amidst intensive predation by Uktan and increasing reduction of easily digestible grasses seems to have resulted in the eventual extinction of both. The call of Mastodon in Kajar by the first children marked the end of that lineage on the mainland, compounded by the slaughter of American Mastodon replicated by the interrupted harvest. Although long assumed to be extinct, one species of insular dwarf proboscidean in the Kaolin Islands has since proven to be a Mastodon, and represents the last gasp of this once thriving lineage. This sort of insular dwarfism occurred many times throughout Earth's history, as well as in Chimere. This has resulted in a number of species long assumed extinct on the mainland to persist. In fact, little proboscideans are so common in the known world that when most Chimerians think of this group of animals, it is not as the biggest land animals as we think of, but far more moderate beasts between the size of a large dog and a pony. Most of these tiny giants, along with a few larger relics on the mainland, will be covered in the next few episodes as we learn about surviving proboscideans in the known world and beyond. Next week will be an overview of the living proboscideans of the known world, the Gomphotheres and their insular cousins. In the following weeks, we will look at two elephants, a study of Dinotheres and Chirul, and the last episode will cover a peculiar and very special oliphant found far beyond the known world. Huge thanks to Ian for sponsoring this episode. Elephants are one of my favorite animals, a passion I inherited from my grandmother. Although I didn't make a setting particularly accommodating to them, exploring their history this week has still been quite meaningful. While I already shared an episode on proboscideans a couple years ago, much of that information will be updated in the coming weeks, though the core of it and the animals covered will be the same. I've had a blast working on all of the art you'll get to see in the coming weeks, and I hope you enjoy. Until next time, stay fantastic, everyone. Cheers, folks!